As we listen to our fellow Americans and how they voted Tuesday night and start to process what that means and look ahead and try to brace ourselves for what Ann and Andrew were talking about, the weeks and months ahead, it's important to remember that we have agency. We have tools at our disposal. If we like the democratic things about our democracy, we can lean on and learn from the wisdom of brave people all over the world who have faced inflection points like this one. One of those people is Maria Ressa, a global champion for truth, the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2021. She has dedicated her life to exposing government corruption and fighting disinformation. On Tim Snyder's on like Tim Snyder's on tyranny, Maria Ressa's book, How to Stand Up to a Dictator, The Fight for Our Future, is a kind of user's guide to moments like this, to navigating these times. So we went back to remind ourselves what Maria told us back in April when she was at this table with us. It was a conversation filled with truth bombs that you might find useful today. There were studies that showed up to 80 to 85 percent of how we vote is not based on what we think. It's based on how we feel, Got it. right? How we feel. You say a lie a million times. It's a fact. Mm -hmm. right? But that the, the second part of that is that if you if you lace it with fear, anger and hate, mm -hmm. it spreads even faster. So we're in an upside down world. But I think it is, it is still possible to turn it right side up. I always say, you know, if you have 100 people in a room and they each have their own personal reality, that's not a room that is an insane asylum. I want to ask you a question about where we are in our fight and if it is as tectonic as it feels. It's interesting that you say it's Earth 2, right, versus reality. I, we still live in the same shared reality in the real world, right? Right. Which, which means there is hope. There is hope. Maria Ressa joins us now. She was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2021, is a board member of the Committee to Protect Journalists, um, which I think is something that we haven't um, thought about needing ourselves. Um, I remember when Donald Trump first won uh, the publisher of the New York Times went to the White House and implored him to stop calling journalists the enemy of the people, not for any of us here in America, but because of its implications around the world. And it, it, it seems like just just taking what Trump has said publicly, his public descriptions of journalists as the enemies of the people oh and his public um, desires to weaponize the Justice Department, it can feel like a scary moment for a free press. Uh, not just a scary moment. This, to me, is a back to the future for us in the Philippines, right? When Trump, when President Trump at that point said that enemies of the people, we heard the exact same thing from President Duterte in the Philippines. But in the campaign, it was, it was shocking to see campaign Trump campaigning using the exact same things that Duterte had said. So, for example, he he was talking about you have to shoot the fake news, shoot the journalists first. That Duterte had had said in different words. Um, he talked about taking away franchises from broadcasters. Well, Duterte did that to the largest broadcaster in the Philippines. He talked about um, oh my gosh, uh, so oh yeah, the mic. You know what he did with the mic? Yeah. Duterte did that in 2016. So those weren't even original. Um... I don't know whether they have the same playbook, but it was shocking to see this all over again and to see it work, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the same threats. I think the, the hard part for journalists in particular is that you're going to have American journalists are going to have to brace themselves. You know, it's funny, the New York Times said this in an ad. He said this, believe him. We didn't believe Duterte when he said, I'm going to kill people if you elect me. He did, <laughs> you know, and he admits it. What is that part of the human mind? Because um, a lot of families have people that voted for Trump. And, they, and when you say, how could you vote for someone that's going to jail journalists? They say, well, I don't, he's not going to do that. What is that piece of the human mind that makes you not believe the parts that are so offensive to you, but do believe the parts that speak to you? It's a failure of imagination. And it's uh, Martin Niemöller's quote, right? It's, as long as it doesn't affect you, you can still stay quiet. 
Uh, but on, but what if it does affect you? What if it's your son or your daughter that's a journalist and you spoke for the person that's threatening to jail them? I mean, I'll give you an example. My parents lived in Florida. Um, and I wrote this in the book, so they gave me permission to say they voted for Trump. They disliked Duterte. But part of it, why? It's very personal. It was because under Obamacare, their health and their medicals went up. You know, there was a reason you needed to pay. And leaders could not explain anymore. You can't heal rifts because our public information ecosystem, social media, big tech has designed a system that literally pulls us apart. So it becomes hard to pull people who are personally angry at something that has affected them.